Good evening. We're happy that you all could join us. Uh, my name is Jim Holmberg. I'm the Curator of Collections here at the Filson. Uh, it's our pleasure to have with us tonight Dr. Daniel Gifford, who will be talking to us about A Christmas Carol's American Roots. Dr. Gifford's career spans academia, museum curation, and administration, including several years with the Smithsonian Institution, public history outreach, and both print and online publishing. His first book examines deep divides at the height of the progressive era as expressed through holidays and holiday imagery, and his expertise on American holidays has been featured by NPR, the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, among many others. He received both his master's and PhD in American history from George Mason University, and he currently teaches at Spalding University and is working on his next book. So, did you know that Dickens' Christmas Carol had American roots? I didn't. Maybe it goes back to his 1842 visit to America and uh, actually when he actually visited uh, Louisville uh, a couple of times in April of 42. Uh, I myself am a, a something of a Christmas Carol geek and, uh, and love it and read it every year and have watched the movies and, and all that. Uh, Doug Prophet told me recently that ATL, if you've ever seen the ATL production of A Christmas Carol, it's the second longest continuously running production of A Christmas Carol in the country. So something that, that Louisville can be proud of. Uh, but uh, we look forward, uh, as Dan tells us tonight, more about the American roots of Charles Dickens' famous A Christmas Carol. So please welcome Dan. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so just a couple things before we get, get started. Um, as you heard, I'm an Americanist. You know, I study American history. Across the pond for me stops somewhere around Nantucket. So, you know, I'm definitely not a British scholar and, and definitely not someone who studies British literature in depth. But I also do study American holidays quite a bit. And you can't study American holidays without running again and again into A Christmas Carol. It's just that popular and that important. Um, I also did a little bit of work uh, when I was at the Smithsonian on the history of philanthropy in America. And that was another place where this particular work came up so often because it's so connected to the idea of, of giving and giving at the holidays. And so I kept encountering this, this work, this, this famous uh, story by Dickens, and in doing so, kept sort of turning my American eye, my Americanist eye towards it and began thinking about it, not in terms of, of him as a British author and what he was doing back in London, but how this might reflect a little bit of his American experience. And we'll talk a little bit about that, although we just got a little bit of a preview already. Um, so that's really where I'm coming at for, uh, in this lecture, is, is looking at this particular work from the American standpoint. The other announcement I always make at the beginning of this lecture is I assume everybody in this room knows this story and has encountered it and knows its you know, beginning, middle, and end already. If you haven't ever read or encountered this story, watched it, seen it, experienced it, I am going to spoil it for you. <laughs> there are major spoilers. They come fast and furious right up front. Um, I'm going to basically wreck the ending for you pretty much from the get-go. So um, if you're comfortable with that, stay put. If you're not comfortable with that, now's the time to, to make your exit. Um, all right, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. I want to just you know, lay out a couple quick things about this uh, particular work. Many of you perhaps already know this. A Christmas Carol was published in December of 1843. It was published in London, um, and it follows... Dickens' first American tour, the tour that took place in 1842. Um, and this was a pretty extensive tour, as we'll see. This was actually a major part of his life uh, for the year of 1842. And then he goes back, and, and by the end of 1843, he has written this, this work, this, uh, uh, A Christmas Carol. In between those two, he also wrote a couple other works, uh, American Notes and Martin uh, Chuzzlewit. 
neither were particularly kind to Americans. Uh, he was pretty scathing in his indictment of how Americans behaved, what he saw, how they acted. Uh, he didn't leave the end of his trip a huge fan of, of American audiences and the folks that he had seen while he toured. Now, this is a, 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 gives you a sense of how far afield he went. Um, he definitely had a lot of ground to cover. He went uh, all up and down the East Coast. And then, interestingly enough, didn't just stop there. He actually he also goes into Canada, but also goes into the heartland, goes into what we you now would call the Midwest, and, and you know, visits a lot of different parts of, of America on this tour. And as you can see, it lasts for six months, nearly six months. So you know, this is not an insignificant amount of time. This is not something that he just sort of, you know, uh, comes over, spends a couple weeks, and heads back. This is a significant part of his life. And just to make sure that we don't miss the, the local flavor, there is not a lot written about his time in Louisville because he didn't spend much time here. He got in town around midnight. Um, he goes to the original Galt Hotel, um, gets some sleep, get, gets up for breakfast the next morning, um, and then pretty much heads right in, into uh, right into a carriage that takes him uh, down to to Portland, and then on to the steamboat that carries him down from there. Uh, really, the only thing that he notes is that you know it's it's a pleasant enough city, a little blackened with smoke, but hey, what isn't? And and then he spends an inordinate amount of time talking about the pigs that he sees on the rest of his journey until he gets onto the steamboat. And that's pretty much you know, what, what he has to say about his stop, uh, stop here. Now, the traditional narrative about sort of America's relationship to A Christmas Carol is that you know, by the time this comes out, we're, you know, people have read these other works, and it's pretty obvious Dickens was not a big fan of America and American citizens and the people that encountered. So the sort of the, the traditional narrative is that Americans didn't like A Christmas Carol. They were mad at Dickens. They, they were sort of incensed at what he'd said about them. Um, and so uh, they, they really didn't embrace it until later. I've actually found a fair amount of evidence that suggests that it was being sold and fairly popular pretty much from the beginning, starting in uh, 1844. And one reason it's a little hard to gauge how much interest there was is has to do with one reason Dickens sort of fell out with America. And that is because as he toured and as he saw his work over and over again in all these American cities, it wasn't the work that was published back home that would have given him the royalties that he was due. These were pirated versions. Um, and these were basically reprints um, that were happening over and over and over again. It's, a, it's, it's actually a very modern story, right? You know, how, how can I see my work being done over and over again, and I'm getting no money for this, and how can these newspapers be doing this? And it sort of sets off the whole relationship off on a bad foot and sort of goes downhill from there. Um, but you know, for what it's worth, I think, you know, Americans sort of gravitated to A Christmas Carol maybe even earlier than, than we realized, that really from 1844, whether they were legitimate copies or not, they were coming over and being read uh, really from, from the very beginning of the story. What is so interesting about this moment, what is so interesting about this tour is Dickens is here at a really important moment in American history because if he had come just, you know, maybe a decade earlier or a couple decades earlier, America would have looked very different. America still would have resembled the sort of rural, bucolic, small uh, villages, rural towns, rural villages, uh, very much an agricultural nation, an agricultural economy, an agricultural uh, um, infrastructure for the nation. But by the time of Dickens' tour, America is rapidly transforming. Now, we call this the transportation revolution, the urban revolution, the market revolution, the capitalist revolution. Whatever you want to call it, it was a revolution. It was a major change in America and a major change in how America was organized and how Americans thought of themselves. They were transforming from a primarily agricultural rural society to one that was based out of cities and one that was based in consumerism and consumption and capitalism and market economies. 
And this was a major transformation that was happening in the span of, of a few years. I mean, less than a generation for a lot of folks. Um, and so in that environment, in that sort of cauldron of change, Americans, you know, we're trying to figure this out. They were trying to figure out what's happening, where are we going, what are we doing, how do I deal with all of this? And so as Dickens was traveling, what he would have seen was an American, a very literate America, uh, lots of literacy in America, and a lot, I would call it a tidal wave, of books and literature and pamphlets and, and uh booklets and the rest that were advice books, etiquette manuals, self-improvement handbooks, moral companions, reprinted lectures, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. This was truly an avalanche of literature, an avalanche of material all centered around this question, how are we to behave? How are we to act? What are we to do? Who are we supposed to be? How do we tell each other apart? How do we know what's right and what's wrong in this new environment, in this new America that's emerging in cities, in these sort of cities that are just popping up out of nowhere, cities like the ones that Dickens goes to on his tour? Yeah, and Dickens is a, is a reader. He's a man of letters. He, he's interested in literature. And, you know, I don't know that travel back then would be that different than travel today. You know, you get to the airport, you sit down, someone's reading a book. You ask, well, what, what are you reading? Is that the new Dan Brown? You know? Yeah. He was, I'm sure, very curious what Americans were reading and was very curious about what, what they were so interested in and why they had so many of these particular types of books. And so, um, you know, a few things that I think re really stand out about this, um, one of my favorite historians, John Casson, has actually looked at these conduct manuals. Again, the idea of how do you conduct yourself? How do you behave? How do you interact? Um, and so these conduct manuals, uh, Casson tells us, um, certainly appeared on both sides of the Atlantic. You know, this was not something that Dickens never would have seen before, but it was unprecedented, the numbers that were appearing in the United States. Americans were the voracious consumers of this. You know, it was really American audiences that just couldn't get enough of, of these and were, were reading them by the hundreds, maybe even thousands, um, way more than Dickens would have familiar, been familiar with back home. The peak of this is happening just as he's getting here. It's happening in the late 1830s and the 1840s. And the publishers are not just these East Coast uh, cities that he would have visited, the New York, the Boston, the Philadelphia, but also those same cities in the heartland that he was also visiting were also small-time producers of these sort of books and pamphlets and guidance and conduct manuals as well. And so, you know, each stop he would have seen new ones, he would have seen reprinted ones, he would have seen the latest crop of them, um, and it's something that he would have encountered you know, throughout his whole six months over and over and over again. And so what I would argue, and sort of my argument here tonight, is that A Christmas Carol is actually situated, is actually part of this literature, is actually part of this literature of conduct manuals and advice uh, manuals and advice books, that it actually is a guide in much the same way that Americans were reading all of these other guides. And that when you start to look at it and you start to dissect it a little bit more, it very much resembles the sort of American literature that Dickens would have encountered during his six months here, then goes back and then writes A Christmas Carol. Ultimately, what I'm going to try to convince you of tonight is that A Christmas Carol belongs in the middle of all of this. Okay. All right, so let's get to it. Let's start to dissect this. Let's start to figure this out. Let's start to, to analyze this a little bit. And so I think a good place to start is with Scrooge, right? I mean, it seems like a good place to start. So Scrooge, <laughs> right? And I think this may be part of the problem of why we don't necessarily think of, the, of this in, in the same ideas. I think we sometimes do think of Scrooge as... Scrooge McDuck swimming in his gold coins. We think of Scrooge as ridiculously rich, ridiculously wealthy, you know, 
just, you know, wealthy beyond belief. And he wasn't. Um, he certainly was rich. He certainly was of, of means, but he was not an aristocrat. He was not of the upper echelon of British society. He was not um, one of the, the lords or barons that, that would have been you know, familiar to, to so many of, of his British audience. What he was was essentially an upper middle class entrepreneur as part of this new economy, this new market economy, this new market revolution. What we're actually told is he is a counting house partner. Okay? Counting house partner more or less equivalent to an accounting firm, you know, a bookkeeping firm. You know, a partner is certainly you know, a good position there. Um, if you're a partner in a good CPA firm today, you're, you're probably pretty well off. But you're not Bill Gates. You know, you're not the wealthiest person in town. You're, you're well off. You're, you're, you're certainly of a upper middle class existence, or perhaps even an upper class existence. But you also have a lot in common with these other professions, things like bankers, lawyers, uh, wholesalers, uh, brokers, even high level government officials. In other words, all of these professions that are not born into wealth, that are not aristocrats, that are not you know, the, the most upper echelon of British society, but are the ones that have developed wealth, that have developed um, their new level of, of income and their new level of, of you know, upper class existence, primarily because of the market revolution, primarily because of this new form of capitalism and consumption, um, the transportation revolution, the idea of goods being able to be moved around, urban revolutions, um, all of these things. And so Scrooge is firmly situated in this sort of echelon of people that are relatively new to wealth, relatively new to the upper class and upper middle class precisely because their occupations are so new um, and, are, and are growing at a time, are creating a strata of society that didn't exist or didn't exist in a significant way just a generation uh, before. Of course, these are the folks who are turning to this literature. These are exactly the folks who are asking the questions, how am I to behave? How am I to act? What am I supposed to do? I have all this money. My parents never had anything like this. I, what do I do? How do I act? Who am I supposed to be? How is this supposed to work? You know, those were the ones that were turning to this kind of literature. And I would say that Dickens intentionally creates Scrooge as a character who would have fit firmly and comfortably in that echelon of those kinds of readers, that those kinds of folks that were seeking this advice. All right, so you have Scrooge. And then we have Scrooge's three visitors, right? So who are Scrooge's three visitors? When I say that, what, what, who are they? The ghosts, right? You know, he has three visitors, you know, and sort of instinctively we know it's the three ghosts. Now, I heard Marley. We'll come back to Marley. Uh, but I would argue that there are three visitors that happened before any of those others. Exactly. So what I want to do is play you one clip. I have about four clips tonight um, from the various uh, incarnations of, of A Christmas Carol that have been done on film. Um, and the first one I want to show you is from the 99 version. This is the one with Patrick Stewart as Scrooge. Um, this is the longest one. Um, the, the other ones are going to be a little shorter than this, but I want to watch it with you, and I want you to pay attention to how many sort of conversations he has, how many encounters he has, how many sort of interactions he has um, while he is at the counting house. What does Dickens sort of set up for us um, at the beginning here? <laughs> A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! Uh, humbug. <laughs> Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean it. I do mean it, sir. Merry Christmas. What reason have you to be merry? What right have you to be merry? You're poor. Well, what right have you to be miserable, then? You're rich. Merry Christmas! Damn your Merry Christmas! 
What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and finding every item dead against you? If I had my way, every idiot who went around with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. Come, uncle. Nephew, you keep Christmas in your way. I'll keep it in mine. But you don't keep it. Then let me leave it alone, then. I still say Merry Christmas. That's all you do say. Much good it does you, much good it'll ever do you. Well, I dare say there are many things I've got a lot of good from which haven't made me a penny profit. Christmas amongst them. You see, Uncle, I've always thought of Christmas as a time for good, not a time for profit. A kind, forgiving time. A time when men and women can think of others. I was never put an extra penny in my pocket, but I believe Christmas has done me good and will do me good. So I still say, Merry Christmas, Uncle. You said something, Mr. Cratchit? No, sir. Another sound out of you, sir, and you'll make this a truly Merry Christmas by losing your job. Uncle, don't be hard on Mr. Cratchit. It's all my fault. Well, you're quite the powerful speaker, sir. Wonder you don't go into Parliament. <coughs> don't be angry, Uncle. Dine with us tomorrow. Dine with you? So you're damned first. But why? Why did you marry? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. <laughs> love. Humbug. Oh, so you won't come to see me because I'm married? Yes. Well, you never came to see me when I wasn't married. Good afternoon, nephew. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry you're so stubborn. But I came here full of the Christmas spirit, so I say again, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. And Merry Christmas to you, Mr. Cratchit. Merry Christmas, sir. You find my nephew amusing, Cratchit. He's oh, a very pleasant fellow, sir. Yeah. You're another Christmas lunatic like him. If you say so, sir. Oh, it seems you doubt me, Mr. Cratchit. What are you, then? Your clerk, Mr. Scrooge. My 15 shilling a week clerk with a wife and family. Did you babble about Merry Christmas? I'll retire to Bedlam. Sir, do you know this area? Tolerably well. We're new to the district. We're looking for the offices of Scrooge and Marley. Some 50 yards along on the right. Good, good. We're collecting charitable donations for the poor of Clerkenwell. You're collecting money on behalf of a charity from Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge? Yes, and Mr. Marley and other businessmen of the neighborhood. <laughs> yes, we think Christmas Eve is the most appropriate time for giving freely. This is the office of Scrooge and Marley. It is, sir. May I press your curiel, sir? <laughs> uh, do I have the honor of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He... Huh. He died seven years ago this very night. Mr. Williams and Mr. Foster, may we offer our sympathy? Why? You're not relatives, are you? No, but we feel sure you must be thinking about him at this time. And I'm sure his generosity is represented by his surviving partner. At this festive time of the year, it is surely desirable that we make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Don't you agree? I take it that you gentlemen are new to the district. New and eager, sir. You will agree, I'm sure, that many thousands of people lack the basic necessities, and many hundreds of thousands lack ordinary comforts. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons, sir. Only in workhouses, are they still in operation? I, yes, they are. I only wish I could say they were not. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. How much may we put you down for, Mr. Scrooge? Nothing. You, you wish to remain anonymous. I wish to be left alone. 
I don't make merry myself at Christmas time, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I support those institutions I have mentioned, and I expect the poor to make use of them. Those who are badly off must go there. Many cannot go there, and many would rather die. If they'd rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Mr. Cratchit, would you show these gentlemen out? It's convenient, sir. It's not convenient. It's not fair. If I was to deduct half a crown for your taking the day off, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. But you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. Uh, fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Well, I suppose you must have the whole day. You'll be here all the earlier the next morning. Yes, sir. Mary. <clears throat> you were about to say something, Cratchit. Nothing, sir. All right, so as you watch this scene, I hope that you saw that there are actually three distinct interactions that take place as the sort of counting house scene unfolds. We have nephew Fred, um, who arrives, and then we have the two portly gentlemen. This is all the name that's ever given um, to them. And then we have the sort of interaction at the end with Cratchit. And what is interesting about these is that each of them centers on a question of obligation, a question of what are Scrooge's obligations as you know, a member of society, as a member of the upper class, as a member of, you know, this new economy, as an employer. Um, so the conversation with Fred ultimately centers around his obligations to family. You know, what do you want from me? I want nothing from you. I just want you to come. Why can't we be friends? Um, pretty clear this, the conversation with the portly gentleman centers around obligations to the poor. Um, and then at the end, the conversation with Cratchit, you know, I suppose you must have the whole day. I suppose you must, uh, you know, have the whole day off. You know, this question of obligation um, at the end. And, and what is Scrooge's response, uh, the famous words that he repeats over and over again in this particular section? Ba humbug. Or, or technically it is ba period humbug, uh, period or exclamation point. And this is an interesting choice of words. It's not the only time Dickens has used humbug in his literature. He does use the phrase other times. But it's certainly the most prominent use of the word humbug in his literature. And what's so interesting is there was another prominent use of humbug in America at exactly the same time that he was visiting. Mr. P.T. Barnum, the prince of humbug. And Barnum sort of defines what a humbug is in America, and it's not necessarily a straight-out lie. Barnum makes his living, makes his fortune, makes his fame off the idea that a humbug could be a lie, could be a falsehood, but it also might be true. If you're the prince of humbug, you don't traffic solely in falsehoods, solely in lies, because what's the point of that? People know you're a liar, they move on. The reason Barnum was so successful is he was able to balance what was fictional, like George Washington's 168-year-old nurse or the Fiji mermaid, with things that were true, things that were accurate, things that were real, um, and sort of leaving it up to the viewer, up to the customer, up to the Americans who were making him so famous to decide for themselves what was truth and what was not. What did they want to take away and claim to be their own, and what did they want to discard and say, that's not for me? That was the essence of humbug. That was the essence of Barnum's success as the prince of humbug. And so this question of, is Christmas a humbug, 
is not really a question about Christmas itself. It isn't a theological question. Scrooge is not saying that he doesn't believe in, in the basis of Christmas. He doesn't say that he's, you know, this is not a theological statement about believing in the nativity story and believing in the, about the Christian origins of Christmas. What he's saying is a humbug are these, all these obligations that people keep telling him that he has to fulfill. Those are the humbugs because those are things that you can decide for yourself whether are, they are true or not whether they are to be believed or not, whether they are to be accepted or not, whether they are truthful or not. And of course, Scrooge's big response is that none of these obligations exist. None of these obligations are true, that they are all humbugs. That all three of these, the obligations to family, the obligations to the poor, and obligations to employees, that each of these is the humbug. That's our starting point. Now, Dickens loved parallelism. Okay? This is the man who wrote, literally wrote a book, A Tale of Two Cities, and opens it with, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. The guy loved parallel structure. And so I don't think it's an accident that these three encounters at the beginning of the story then are followed by three encounters that form the rest of the story. And in fact, I would argue that the three ghosts that we just mentioned a few minutes earlier are, in fact, parallels to each one of these conversations. That the trip with Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas past, is ultimately to understand and to work through this question of obligation to employees. That the visit with Christmas present is working through the question of obligations to family. And that the final visit with the ghost of Christmas future resolves the question of obligations to the poor. That it is actually a parallel structure. It is a system of parallelism that Dickens has built into the story precisely because he wants it to be a roadmap. He wants it to be easy to follow. He wants it to be a series of markers that readers can follow just like advice manuals and conduct manuals and all the other bits of literature that he was encountering. You know, those sort of roadmaps to behavior, those sort of roadmaps to questions of obligation and conduct. And so I think this is absolutely why he establishes three encounters at the beginning of the story so that he can then parallel them and the rest of the story. But, as many of you pointed out, before we get to this, we did have one other ghost to deal with, right? We have Marley. That's Marley's role in all of this. Well, Marley is really interesting because I think we sort of think of Marley as, you know, coming to Scrooge and warning him and sort of foreshadowing everything. But I think we sometimes forget what Marley's message actually was. Marley didn't come to Scrooge saying, you know, Look, you got to give up all your money. You got to get out, you know, give give away everything. You're you're a miser and you need to, you know, give it all to charity. That's actually not his message. His message is that Scrooge needs to do more to get out among people. He needs to do more to engage in this world of strangers that has grown up around him and all these other people that are living in urban areas in the middle of a market revolution that those sort of senses of community and knowledge and knowing who everyone is in their small town and knowing their stories, that's all that's been disrupted. And what Marley's message is, is not, you know, hey, give away all your money. It's get out and walk among your fellow men. Travel far and wide. Walk beyond the counting house. Uh, Go beyond the narrow limits of the money-changing hole. Yes, charity, forbearance, benevolence are in there, but make mankind your business. Okay? This is precisely the kind of advice that would have been part of these advice manuals and conduct manuals as well, that you need to engage with people in order to understand them, and you need to engage people in order to understand your role and your situation with them. And Marley is essentially parroting a lot of the same messages in his encounter with Scrooge. It isn't just about charity and benevolence. It's actually about engaging with the world of strangers that has been created over the past generation or so. All right, so let's go ahead and hit the first ghost, the ghost of Christmas past. Um, And this is an interview. The counter begins in Scrooge's bedroom, and I'll come back to why that's important 
um, in a little bit. So uh, to sort of focus in on this, what I want to do is show you uh, the next clip. This one is from the 84 film. This is the George C. Scott uh, Scrooge version. Um, and I want to want to have you watch this space of Fezziwigs. Watch what happens um, in this physical space. Watch what happens and the relationship and how that relationship is connected um, to this place of work, this place of employment, this place where Scrooge, um, you know, in his younger years was the employee and someone else was the master and the employer. You know this man? It's old Fezziwig. Hmm? Oh, yes, my dear. Would you ask uh, Mr. Pulling to refer that matter to Mr. Scrooge? Eh? Uh, thank you, my dear. And you know this place? No, it was I not apprenticed here. Yeah. You... Pay attention, everybody. Dick, Ebenezer, pens down. No more work tonight, boys. It is Christmas Eve. Uh, so, close those ledgers down, Ebenezer and Dick. Clear away in here, everybody. We need the room. Uh, here we go, lad. Hat. You'll enjoy yourself tonight, Master Ebenezer. That is an order. Yes, sir, I'll try. You will put your heart in it. You put enough of yourself into your work, and I have nothing but praise for the way you've discharged your duties. But you're young, eh? There's more to life than a... Bolts of cloth and musty old ledgers. <laughs> it's Mrs. Fezziwick and the three daughters and their suitors. And Belle. I've forgotten how beautiful she was. Hello, Belle. you danced, Ebenezer? Waste of time, dancing. You didn't think so then? There was a reason then. There's been a change in you since you'll come to Fezziwigs. You were so gloomy. Oh, I think I should warn you, Miss Bell. I am of a serious bent of mind. I consider seriousness to be an admirable trait of character, but it can be overdone. I should take heed of your advice, ma'am. And go through life with a grin on my face. Come along, you two. They're striking up Sir Roger de Coverley. Time enough to sample the punch when you're old and fat like me, eh? I'd best partner my wife before that young scamp goes dancing off with her. Oh, what a difference it makes, Ebenezer, to travel the rough road of life with the right female to help bear the burden, eh? <laughs> what a lucky man I am! Shall we join the others, Ebenezer? My pleasure, Miss Bell. <laughs> Fezziwig, a silly man. Silly? Why, why silly? What did he do, after all, to deserve the praises of those apprentices? Spent a few pounds, danced like a monkey, beamed a great smile. Well, the happiness he gave, I gave was quite as great as though it had cost a thousand pounds. Just small things. So a couple things there to note in this particular scene, in this particular part of the, the story. Uh, 
First of all, notice how collapsed the space is when it comes to employment and life outside of, of employment and it's outside of that idea of uh, employer and employee. You know, the, literally the, the cloth merchant, the warehouse, transforms into the same space where the holiday is celebrated. The family comes into the space. The food is brought into the space. There is no separation. There is no se separate sphere, separate uh, entities, separate parts of the, uh, the lives in this sort of old social order. You know, going back again, this is going back to the past. That idea that a master and, and as apprentice, master and a servant, you know, were largely a familial relationship. It was very fatherly, it was very paternalistic, uh, right down to, you know, the place of employment and the place of celebration, collapsing into one and the same. Um, so think about that. What Dickens also does is introduces us to Bell, which is interesting, you know, because, you know, you have this, this character of Bell. And it's very conceivable that Scrooge, or that Dickens could have taken Scrooge in a very different direction at this point in the story. That the whole point of the story could have had a very different ending. <laughs> that the whole point was that he was supposed to find Belle uh, in modern day London, that he was to you know, admit that he had always loved her and she had been waiting for him. And the part of his redemption was that you know, true love would be found after all this time. Doesn't happen. Very quickly, he establishes that Belle gets married, Belle is happy, Belle has kids, and sort of writes off that part of the story. And essentially, you know, is introduced and then is quickly dropped. So the whole point of going to the past is not to deal with Belle, but to deal with his question of being an employer. When the book ends, when the story ends, it is told to us that he becomes as good a friend and as good a master. Oops, sorry about that. As anyone in the city knew. Um, in other words, it was resolving this question of was he a good employer that becomes the basis of the visit to the past. You know, the question of love, of romance, of finding, you know, Belle again, that's not what happens. What happens is coming to terms with the relationship that has been disrupted by this market revolution, this idea that these close relationships, this sort of collapsed space, this sort of collapsed world where employees and employers lived in the same environment, worked in the same environment, sort of had these familiar relationships, that's what's been disrupted. That's what's been blown apart. That's what no longer exists in this new economy. You know, you can't imagine the counting house having this sort of environment, this party environment, because it's a new economy, it's a new reality. And so what Scrooge has to figure out for himself is what is his new relationship in this new economy, in this market revolution, in this capitalist revolution, in this consumer revolution, to his employees. That's the whole point of the visit to Christmas Pass. That's the whole point of the visit to Fezziwigs, is to go through that process of remembering and then resolving it for himself. And what's really interesting is the very end of that encounter, before they leave Fezziwigs, the last thing he says, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. Dickens is telling us exactly where Scrooge's mind is in this visit to the past, exactly what he's trying to resolve. Which obligation is he trying to figure out by going to the past? And at the end of the book, his redemption is all about inviting uh, Cratchit into the house, not to live, but to visit, and to work with him to come up with some sort of new familial relationship um, that, that is similar to, to Fezziwig's, but is newly born and newly created based in the real economy and the real realities of 1840s. All right. Now, I mentioned that this whole visit to the with the ghost of Christmas past begins in the bedroom. And the reason I point that out is that is not where the visit of the ghost of Christmas present begins. Ghost of Christmas present requires Scrooge to leave the bedroom and go out into the parlor. Okay, the parlor, the place where families celebrate the holidays the place where families gather, the place that are, is decorated for the holidays. And of course, the ghost of Christmas present has it all decked out 
uh, in, in Christmas cheer and Christmas uh, decorations, uh, just as it would be for a, a, a upper class family celebrating uh, this time of season. So this second encounter begins in the familial space, begins in the space that is focused on family. Okay? So right, at, right away, we're already seeing the groundwork for this visit. This second visit is going to parallel this question of what are the obligations to family. One of the things that I think is interesting that Dickens does to set this up. In the chapter about Marley's ghost, these are all the references to food. Okay? The next chapter where he goes to the past, these are the references to food. The chapter for Christmas present, 65 references to food. This, this is a, uh, a word chart that shows you just how, how often the various words were used. Now, it's entirely possible that Dickens was just really hungry when he wrote this one. <laughs> or, I think more likely, he is trying to get us into the right frame of mind. He's trying to put us in the frame of mind of the familial celebration of Christmas, you know, Parlors, food, feasting, gathering, bringing people together, eating lots of stuff when your, your family is together. Those are the things that he's trying to communicate in this chapter because he wants Scrooge to work through these questions of obligation to family. And it seems a little weird, right? You know, why should you have to figure out your obligations to family. Doesn't everyone kind of know what their obligations to family are at the holidays? Why do we have to have a whole chapter about this? And why does Scrooge have to go through this process? But interestingly enough, this was a moment in history, and particularly American history, as Dickens was touring, um, that this question of family was going through disruption. Because all those forces I've been talking about, the transportation revolution, the market revolution, the consumer revolution, was disrupting families. Families were being blown apart. Families were moving to different parts of the country. Families were no longer together. And when you read American Notes, one thing you notice over and over again is how many times Dickens encountered people who were traveling in order to go back to families. Uh, wives separated from husbands. Fiancés separated from their betrothed. Sons and daughters separated from mothers and fathers. People were traveling with Dickens because, precisely because their families were disrupted. And so this question of, well, isn't it obvious what obligations to family are, are not so obvious in the 1840s because within the span of a generation, you've gone from families being very insular and very close together and very nuclear within small rural communities to being busted apart, to being spread out, to being dispersed. That's new. How do we deal with that? And how do we deal with that around the holidays? And it's really interesting because Dickens actually writes into the story a scene that often is forgotten that actually deals with this exact question. Um, so we're going to go back to the 99 version, and I'll show you this short clip um, from uh, part of his, his tour with Christmas Present. Martha. It's such a goose, Martha. <laughs> You'll not believe it. Oh. <laughs> Bless my heart alive, my dear. You're late. We had a great deal of work to finish off, so I slept all night in the workshop. Then we had to clear away this morning. She sounds a very hard-working young girl. She has to be. Never mind, never mind, as long as you're here. You sit yourself down by the fire and have yourself a good warm. No, no, here's Father coming. Father's coming. Hi, Martha. Go on, hide. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Father. And so say all of us. Come on, Tim. You need a wash. I didn't know Cratchit had a crippled son. Why didn't you ask? Where's Martha? It's not coming. Not coming? Not coming Christmas Day? <laughs> Martha! <laughs> It's Martha! <laughs> oh. <laughs> of course it is. 
<laughs> Come on, girls. Let's get the table laid. All right, so you have this scene where Bob Cratchit believes for a moment that Martha has not come home for the holidays, you know, and it shocks him, it depresses him, because he understands this to be the obligation of families during this period, that you come home for the holidays. And in fact, it is in the 1840s that this whole idea of home for the holidays really begins to take off in American culture. This idea that you had home for the holidays, that you had home for the homestead, that you make it home for Thanksgiving or Christmas or both, uh, precisely because families have been disrupted. And so we see, of course, the Cratchits know their obligation. Martha does come. It's all, it's all a trick. It's all a ruse. It's all a game. Um, but Scrooge himself also has to see this, has to see this idea of familial obligation, the idea of coming home for the holidays, um, acted out and presented for him. Now, this is not Scrooge's family. You know, the Cratchits are not Scrooge's family, and when the sort of redemption comes, he does not spend Christmas with the Cratchits. He has his own family that he has to negotiate this with. He has his own family that he has to reenact this sort of popular culture trope of going home for the holidays. And so within the context of the visits with Christmas present, we then have this other encounter where he goes over to Fred's, and I'll use the Muppet version uh, for this one. It's, it's Fred. My dear nephew Fred and his wife Clara, having Christmas with friends. <gasps> hey, look, fruit. Well, there now. We've had the plum pudding and sung the carols. What now, my lovelies? A game, Fred. Yeah, we must have a game at Christmas. Do people play games at Christmas? Uh, I love games. <laughs> yeah. uh, Say, do you know that fruit is wax? Oh, yeah. I wondered about the texture. <laughs> Let's play yes and no. Oh, a wonderful game. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, no. That's a great game. Yes, I'll be it. Yes, let Fred be it. He always thinks of good things. I do have a good one, Clara. <laughs> Guess. Is it vegetable? No. Mineral? No. Animal, then? What else? What else, indeed? Uh, is it found on a farm? Never. In the city? Usually. Oh. Does it pull a handsome cab? <laughs> Certainly not. How about a dog? No. A cat? A cat? I said it first. No. Uh. Wait then, is it an unwanted creature? Often. A mouse! No. A rat! You called? A cockroach! No. A uh, witch! Oh dear, it's too wonderful. Wait, wait, I know. An unwanted creature, but not a rat, a leech, or a cockroach. Then what? Then what? What? It's Ebenezer Scrooge. Yes! That's a killer! <laughs> Come, there's much to see. No more. I wish to see no more. All right, and in, but in spite of that scene, in spite of knowing this information, as part of Scrooge's redemption, he does go home for the holidays. He goes to not the Cratchit's house, but Fred's house. He actually, you know, makes peace and comes through the front door and asks if he can participate as part of the family, very much following the trope that Dickens had seen over and over again in America of coming home for the holidays being this sort of newly negotiated, newly transpiring obligation of families that really, for the first time in, in just the span of a generation, had to figure that out for themselves because they weren't all together. They weren't in the same village. They weren't in the same town. They weren't in the same community anymore. And so what are those obligations? That's what Scrooge figures out during his trip uh, with Christmas present. And then the handoff to Christmas future happens not back at the residence, but right out there on the street. Okay? Uh, Christmas present, you know, sort of dissolves. Christmas future rapidly appears. And it all happens right there on the street. The street. The home of the poor. The home of the destitute. You know, this is where the poorest classes live or out on the street. 
And so again, right away, right from the beginning of the encounter with a ghost, Dickens is communicating with us, telegraphing for us what he wants us to focus on, what obligation, what question is going to be resolved in this visit. This is also the visit that famously the ghost of Christmas future has the two skeletal children under his robes, the the children who are ignorance and want. Uh, But the fact that they are children is important. The idea that we're going to see children over and over again in this chapter um, is important. You know, the idea that children are the future, children are the next generation, children are what we focus on when we're thinking about, um, you know, whether the future is going to be better or worse. Um, This is the question that Dickens establishes around the poor, the fact that these two first two children that we encounter are the most destitute, are the most skeletal, are the most uh, decrepit of all the poor, um, that they are, 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 are almost horror-like um, in, their, in their continents. Now, the visit with Christmas Future is pretty far-ranging. He actually goes through a fair number of encounters. Uh, he goes past some of his own class, merchants of his own class, Um, who are basically laughing up uh, about Scrooge's death. Um, There is the sort of nefarious lower classes, the charwoman, the laundress, and the undertaker's man who are fighting over his possessions that have been basically robbed out of the the apartment. Um, And then there's one that we often forget about where we find out that Scrooge had tenants. Um, He owned a a property that had renters um, who had fallen behind in their rent. They're worried that they're going to be tossed out on the street with their children. Um, and then they find out, uh, no, Scrooge is dead, and she has this sort of inappropriate reaction of, of clapping, um, and then recognizes that that is not so appropriate, not so Christian. Um, and then, of course, the, the major and most heartfelt encounter of all of them, uh, the visit back to the Cratchits. Uh, home. With that encounter, that final encounter, we come circle back to this question of children, okay? And we sort of put the spotlight on Tiny Tim and Tiny Tim's future and whether Tiny Tim can survive without Scrooge fulfilling his obligations to the poor. Um, And what's so interesting about Tiny Tim is he makes the perfect charity case, okay? Tiny Tim, first of all, he's a child, you know, so him being poor is of, of you know, no fault of his own. Um, he is crippled, so the fact that he's poor is not a question of laziness, is not a question of uh, bad manners and bad uh, instincts. Um, and most importantly, he doesn't beg. You know, he actually feels sorry for other people. He actually tries to help other people. Uh, So he's the ideal charity case precisely because he doesn't ask for charity. Uh, He's precisely worthy of of being the recipient of charity because he doesn't ask for it, because he's not a beggar. And this was really one of the ultimate questions of this whole body of literature I've been talking about tonight. Because when you live in a disrupted world where you don't know anybody's stories, where you don't know know, who's down on their luck for a good reason and who's down on their luck because they're lazy and drunk, um, when you don't have that information, when you don't have ready access to that knowledge, how are you supposed to know what your obligations to the poor are? How are you supposed to know who is deserving and who is not when it comes to charity? So if you're walking in a world of strangers, these urban streets that are now filled with people you don't know. Who's the one to give charity to? Who's the right one? Who's the deserving one? Who's the trustworthy one? Is it the woman? Is it the kid? Is it the tramps? How do you know? How do you know those things without having that information? And this raft of literature, this tidal wave of literature, was very much concerned about questions of authenticity and finding out people's information and deducing people's information and using that information in order to be a good steward of charity, in order to be a good steward of giving away funds in a way that made sense and would not contribute to larger societal problems. You know, this was the basis of the question of your obligation to charity. And for Dickens, 
he makes sure that we read over and over again that this visit to Christmas future has resulted in Scrooge not just being charitable, but being the right kind of charitable, to have learned the correct lessons about his obligations to the poor. And I'll give you a few examples of this. When he re-encounters the two portly gentlemen at the end, he whispers an amount in their ear, we never know how much it is, but they react with, with great surprise at how much he's going to give them. So, you know, he's being charitable. You know, was that, was that the whole point? Not necessarily, because then Dickens writes that Scrooge says to, to one of the gentlemen, come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will, cried the old gentleman, and it was clear he meant to do it. Why does Scrooge need to have him come visit? Why does he need another discussion? Why does he need another encounter? Because he wants that information. He wants that connection. He wants to make sure that that money is being spent and used in the right way, that it's going to the right people, that it's being used in the correct way, uh, is being used in a way that fits with the proper obligations to the poor as he's learned it uh, through the course of his adventures, particularly with Christmas Future. Now, of course, Tiny Tim, we've already just figured that out. He's a clear-cut case, no question about that. Poster child for, for good charity. Uh, he absolutely is deserving, and we know Scrooge takes care of him as well as part of his redemption. What we also learn is that Scrooge gets out, just as he was supposed to, gets out on Christmas Day. He wanders the streets. He goes to church. And one thing he does, he questions the beggars. Questions the beggars on Christmas Day. You know, again, Dickens is showing not just that, that Scrooge has become charitable, not just that Scrooge is loosened up on the purse strings, but that he's asking the right kinds of questions. He's asking the kind of information that has to be reconstructed when you live in a world of strangers. He's figuring out who the beggars are that deserve charity and who the beggars that don't deserve charity are by questioning them, by continuing the conversation, by continuing um, to ask about uh, where the charity is going. This is exactly what Marley told him to do, right? Marley's message, remember, was not give away all your money. It was to get out there, to walk among your fellow men, to get beyond the counting house, to make mankind your business. You know, it's exactly the kind of obligation to the poor that Marley was describing to him at the very beginning before this whole encounter started. And just to make sure that we don't miss the point, Dickens then ends the encounter with the ghost of Christmas future by reminding us that Scrooge will honor my heart, keep it all the year, live in the past, present, and future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach, that each one of them has taught him a lesson, that each one of them has taught him an obligation, each one of them has taught him a way to bridge this question of obligation that he declared a humbug back in the counting house, that each one of these is a parallel to that original encounter in the counting house, and that each one of these has a through line in which these obligations are resolved. These obligations are figured out. These obligations have come full circle, and Scrooge now knows what to do. He now knows what he's supposed to do. He's figured it out. Almost as if he'd read an advice book, an etiquette manual, a conduct manual. Scrooge now knows how to conduct himself as a member of this new emerging class, a member of this new emerging economy, as a member of this new emerging society, precisely the society that Dickens saw over and over again drawing on literature just like this throughout his American tour. And so that's why I argue that A Christmas Carol very much has American roots, that he is taking these ideas that he saw in America of a literature, a vast wave of literature, dealing with questions of conduct and obligation, and brought them with him, brought them forward back to London, and put them into what we now know as one of the most beloved Christmas tales that we read each year. Thank you.
We have time for a few questions. If you want to ask Stan a question, please just raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you so everyone can hear it. In the back there. And while that's going around, I'm just going to put up a slide. I put one book into my presentation, and if there's other readings that you'd be interested in, um, these were some of the works I consulted and drew, drew from um, in, in developing this lecture. Uh, sir, did you do your PhD on this topic? So my PhD was actually on holiday culture, American holiday culture. So um, uh, not this specifically, but certainly this adjacent. <laughs> Certainly, uh, he spent more time in England than he did in the United States. England was uh, a hotbed of literature also. Uh, you say that his six months in the States might have influenced this particular production mm -hmm. uh, more so, but would he not have had the similar uh, moral influences or lessons, moral lessons coming out of England? Really good question. So... Um, certainly this kind of literature was not unheard of in, in England, certainly existed in England, but it was way more prominent in the United States. It was way more circulated in the United States, uh, just more of it in every way. Um, so more copies of it coming from more places, more versions, versions for men and women, young and old. Um, there was just a lot more of it in America that he surely would have noticed. He would have noticed that Americans were reading a lot more of this than, than his British counterparts. The other thing that I think is kind of interesting is I think it was worth going back to this point that Dickens really didn't like Americans by the time he was done. Um, and I was actually reading recently a BBC article about his, his feud with America, and one word that they used um, is that he, Dickens felt like they were very acquisitive, not inquisitive, acquisitive, that they were very concerned with acquiring wealth, maintaining money, maintaining property, getting more stuff and holding on to it. Sound like a character we know? So part of me thinks that, yes, he absolutely would have encountered this kind of literature back home too, but would have used this as an opportunity to make sure that he positioned his own piece of literature in the same vein so that his British audience wouldn't follow the same path as what he saw his American audience as already having to, to work through and negotiate. That if he could perhaps even short circuit that by getting ahead of it, um, that that might be a, a value to his British audiences as well as a response to what he had seen in America. Yes, I had a question. Uh, I'm kind of vague on this, but I had heard that someone had did, had uh, written either a story or a play about kind of a sequel to Christmas through the Christmas Carol, where Tiny Tim travels over and fights in the Civil War. Have you heard anything about that? <laughs> I don't know that one. I do know. Um, was, I do, uh, I'm not there, sure. It's like I mean, it's, I mean, probably I would heard something about someone either wrote a short story or a play. I do know there's a. Um, uh, I think he's written two books now, and I'm, I, he's actually a DC author, so I'm, I'm kind of familiar with him, and I'm, his name is totally escaping me at the okay. moment. But it is, I don't remember him doing the Civil War, but I, it's Tiny Tim Grown Up. Tiny Tim Grown Up, yeah. No. And, and so the main character is Tiny Tim, and, and, and he ends up like solving mysteries, okay. I think. <laughs> yeah. okay. So it's sort of like Tiny Tim meets Sherlock Holmes sort of thing. All, you know, obviously all, all very derivative okay. and, and only written you know, a few okay. years ago. Okay, uh, I was wondering about that, because again, it was supposed to be like where he got well, and he traveled to America and joined the war. Yeah. So, thank you. Sure. Oh, maybe one. No, so the question was, was he actually here for a Christmas? No, he gets over here in January and he's gone, um, you know, by, by July. So the six months that he was here were not over Christmas themselves, um, you know. I think that's a valid point, you know, that he didn't actually experience a Christmas. I guess my argument is more... Um, that he, he took sort of the lessons that he saw, these questions of obligation, and put them into a Christmas context, even without having, having had to see that context in America. It was, you know, as a, as a great 
author and a great, you know, great imagination, he was able to sort of make that leap, you know, when he wrote, wrote the work. I was wondering, prior to Dickens' time, was Christmas a little bit more of a uh, rowdy celebration in some respects? Yes, so the, the history of Christmas, I mean, how much time do we have here? <laughs> so the history of Christmas is really interesting, and certainly in the 1700s and early 1800s, it was a very different experience. Um, it was much more about groups of young men getting drunk and getting rowdy and basically going around the village um, and wassailing and mumming. And if you think of it, you know, here we go, wassailing. Now bring, some, bring me some figgy pudding. Uh, bring some right now. We won't go until we get some. You know, these lyrics actually are about what Christmas traditions were largely about. And it was about the poor classes sort of going to the homes of the rich classes and making demands and making a lot of noise and making a lot of mischief um, and until they got, you know, more food and, and honestly a lot more drink. Um, and this is why a lot of people didn't like Christmas. Um, by the 18... 18- 40s when he's writing this, and I would say really the transition begins uh, as early as the 1820s because you can start to see some of these changes in the Moore poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas, or A Visit from St. Nicholas. But in those intervening years, that practice really died out. And the reason it died out is, imagine you're in a village. Imagine this room here is the village. And some group of you are going door to door, you know, knocking on the door, kind of drunk, making demands, saying, you know, bring us, bring us some mead, bring us some figgy pudding, we're not going anywhere until we get some, we're going to make a lot of noise, we're going to kind of scare your kids. Is it really dangerous? No, I mean, you know, you know who's there, you know their stories, you know where they're going to be the next morning, you know where they're going to be sleeping it off, you know who their father is, you know who their mother is. You know, it's a contained experience, it's a contained ritual. Once America sort of begins to disperse from that rural society into these urban areas where you have a world of strangers, the the very same conditions I've been describing all night, those rituals don't make sense anymore. You know, now suddenly you're an upper-class guy and you have a bunch of young thugs knocking on your door demanding (laughs) drink and food and, and money. You're like, I don't know who these people are. I don't know their story. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't, I can't follow up if I feel in danger, I don't, you know, it's no longer a safe, sane ritual. And so that ritual sort of dies away in part because of the urban revolution, in part because of the world of strangers that America was becoming more and more accustomed to. And so in that void, you have new rituals of Christmas that begin. It becomes much more domestic, it becomes much more interior, it becomes much more female led and female driven, becomes much more about gift giving and children um, and food. You know, many of the things that I was saying Dickens is telegraphing to us in that middle chapter, the, the, the Christmas present, precisely because of the questions of family and the questions of family obligation. So it's, yes, it's, it's, the transformation begins to take place a little earlier than this, uh, but certainly is still sort of in flux and in transformation you know, by the time he's writing this, by the time he's, he's visualizing this. Um, and that transformation is very much part of that similar question of obligations to, to family at the holidays. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.